I want to welcome each and every one of you to Second Avenue and want to welcome you to God's worship. We have a few announcements today. I want you to know that our Bible study that is held on Thursdays, every Thursdays, moved to 1 o'clock. So those of you who are not doing anything and stay home, uh, Thursday at 1 o'clock, we have a very interesting topic of bearing witness in, in such a time as this. We are having one celebration after another at our church as well. So on, on the 4th of July, some of you will be out of town, but we will be celebrating Maria and uh, Louis's wedding vow reaffirmation. There'll be a great party. We'll eat together and I hear dancing and drinking water will be going on. <laughs> drinking water. <laughs> so like that, uh, on your calendar will be a very festive day and plan to come. Um, I think Jill and Beth are preparing all the food. So if you have any questions, ask, uh, them, ask them questions. Happy Father's Day to all men who are here this morning. And Jill and Susan have a, a, a little something for uh, Well, Jill's not here. Jill's not here, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, Susan and, and Beth, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, in the fine tradition of the UMW, um, we are going to present our oldest and youngest uh, awards today. I might be in the running for youngest. I mean, y'all got to step your game up a little bit. Come on. So, um, I'm an officer and Susan's an officer in UMW. There's Lynn. I just lost out on youngest. But, uh, we are recognizing our mothers as well as our fathers today. Hey, Carrie. Um, because we were not able to get it together soon enough to recognize our mothers because we had just started coming back um, when we did that. So, hi, Clark. Y'all behaving today? No. 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 Okay. Okay. Wouldn't expect it to, would you? Oh, you I, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, happy Mother's Day, happy Father's Day, happy Parents' Day. I would like to ask you if you are a parent or a step parent, would you stand up so that you could be recognized, please? This is about everybody. Let's hear everybody. <laughs> Good thing or a bad thing, right? <laughs> um, anyway, let's start out with the moms. Um, now, my dad used to do that. What was his name? George something. He used to do this, and he would get in trouble just about every time because when you start ticking off people's ages, I hate to say this, but particularly women, we tend to get a little bit sensitive. Yes, we do. We do. Okay, so we're going to shoot for the top. We're going to go for the top. If you are a mom, and you are age 90 and up, would you stand up, please, if you can? <laughs> 90 and up, we got two! Woo! I, think we should, I think we should make them arm wrestle for it. <laughs> 95 and up? 90, 95 and up? Okay. I'm going to give, I'm going to take the liberty of not doing the youngest, sorry Lynn, and I'm going to give Vesper and uh, Betty both recognition as our 50. Would you stand up, please?
Um, 77 and up. 80 and up. Uh-oh, did I hit everybody? <laughs> more award and I was going to do the newest church member but I'm looking around and I think we're all old as far as that goes um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty here and I'm going to give this to my mom Aww. so happy Mother's Day darling <laughs> you to know on behalf of the UMW, ladies, you're all invited to come to UMW. We had a lovely pool party at Cindy's house. We would love to see you all there at our next meeting, which I don't remember the date of, but it will be published. So please look for that. We appreciate all of you as parents. We appreciate all of you as parental role models. I know that when my two grew up in this church, they had a lot of people looking after them. And that was a good thing because uh, I wasn't always there, you know. So anyway, we appreciate all of you. Happy Parents Day to all. Thank you.
minutes as we listen to your word proclaimed this morning. May your Holy Spirit hover over us, stir in our hearts, so that we may hear your word, not just hear your word. May your word bear fruit in our hearts. Lord, continue to give us courage and strength to pray and to listen to your word and study your word. Continue to give us passion for you and hunger for your ways. And Lord, now we pray. May all the words of my mouth and all the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. You are indeed our rock, our Abba Father, and our Savior. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, we are studying Acts this summer as, uh, as our in-depth study, so I encourage all of you to read along and ask questions and pray, and especially pray for our church and all the members. It's a chaotic time, confusing time sometimes. We have so many voices and we have so many people saying, let's go this way, let's go that way. So I pray that you would pray for our church, that we be the church of God, follow the will of God, and in the process, not kill each other, but love each other. In the book of Acts, the church, in matter of weeks, Grew from 12 to 120 to 3,000 and then to 5,000. Something important, something remarkable was happening in this new movement. Well, there's the answer. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there with them, empowering them and leading them and taking them every step of the way. Everything they did, they prayed, they asked for Holy Spirit's guidance. And they received this boldness in their hearts to proclaim the good news of the gospel. In the middle of all this, when everything was going so well, the disciples were arrested. Why? Because they testified to Jesus. Because they testified to Jesus' name and saved people from sin and death. Heal people in the name of Jesus. They claim boldly that there is resurrection. There is not just physical resurrection, but Resurrection of our souls, of our faith, the new life. They did it so passionately, so confidently, and so boldly. They stood in front of the elders as they were arrested, the Sanhedrin. They stood before its members. And these members were very intimidating people during that time, and still is, I guess, because of their family lineage. It says in verse 4, verse 6 today, Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas. John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family, those aristocrats, they were there. Its members were based not only on their family lineage and privilege, but also social prominence, those elders. And because of their high education, scribes. But the majority of the Sanhedrin members were Sadducees. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in resurrection, period. So I think the disciples were arrested because they preached resurrection, preached the resurrection of Jesus, preached the resurrection of our lives. And they were very much threatened 
very much offended. How many of you have been to a Georgia General Assembly? Some of you. How many of you have been to a court, upper court? Well, we've all been, you know, going to pay your ticket. When I, I remember when I went for the first time, I was 18 and I was paying my speeding ticket and I didn't want to uh, have the record. So I went to the court and I remember how intimidated I was. It was a big deal. And there were all grown-ups, important people. Now you know how Peter and John felt. The assembly of 71 elders in a big fancy hall coming together to make legislative, judicial, and political, and sometimes ethical decisions. The Sanhedrin was right uh, connected to the uh, temple sanctuary that's very intimidating, isn't it? North side of the temple sanctuary, half of it was a balcony so they could go out and make decrees. And the other half, they sat together and put their heads together to make decisions. These 71 elders, they were very intimidating figures. In the second temple period, during Jesus' time, during Paul's time in the first century, the great Sanhedrin had the ultimate power in that country. It's like the U.S. Capitol. And Peter and John, rednecks from the region of Galilee, not educated, not having the right terminology, they stood before these elders. But they were bold. They testified to Jesus. This is the same Peter, same John, who were just so timid and fled after Jesus died on the cross. Their Peter and John were summoned and stood and asked by these big figures, by what power or by what name did you do this? Can you imagine? By what power, by what authority, by what name did you do this? This being healing the lame man, born lame, and preaching to people about the resurrection of Jesus. There they were. And this is what Peter said in front of them. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. This is Peter. Can you hear Peter? Then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you. I can't imagine this is the same Peter. He was bold. He was articulate. He was to the point. And he was convincing. Where did this boldness come from? Where did this boldness come from? In the biblical sense, this holy boldness. Boldness is not a personality trait. It's not something you are born with. A typically soft-spoken, introverted, calm person can be bold at a time when a typically driven, spoken, brash person shrinks back. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work. Holy boldness is acting, not just saying it's acting by the power of the Holy Spirit. A 
on an urgent conviction in the face of a threat. This contains three ingredients that, that we need in the holy boldness. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit inspired conviction, courage, and also right timing. Without sufficient conviction that something ought to be said or done, what's there to be bold about? Without sufficient courage, we don't have enough fiber in our conviction to face opposition. Without a sense of timing, good timing, we, we lack the five punchline. We lack the timing. We lack the fire under our feet to get us moving. There were people in the Bible who were full with holy boldness. There's so many, I can't name them all, but I can give you two examples. Moses is number one. Moses had every reason to be bold, but he was not. He messed it all up. <clears throat> he had identity crisis, identity problems from the get-go. He said, uh, am I an Egyptian? Or am I an Israeli? Am I a prince of peace? Or am I a criminal? Am I a prince of Egypt? Or am I a fugitive? He faced his insecurities and fears all the time, everywhere he was, until he faced God in that burning bush and he conquered his insecurities and fears. How about Nathan? Nathan the prophet. He saw what the king, not just any king, but King David, most beloved, most hailed king, who was bold and courageous. You know, he defeated Goliath. He was fierce in battle and he was the one to unite the kingdom of Israel not just any king but when he saw this king do something wrong he held the king accountable for what he has done with Bathsheba which was just adultery and murder back in those days a king could commit adultery left and right, you know, and killed anybody and everybody he did not like. But Nathan held him accountable. Yeah. Can you imagine saying to the most powerful man in the universe, you are the man, straighten up. That was holy boldness. With Holy Spirit and power conviction, courage, and also right timing. This week, I heard a story. I have heard wonderful stories of fathers on the news and on the radio and podcasts, and so have you. One kind of stuck with me. It was a story of a man who was adopted telling his story on the radio that after he turned 18, he went to locate his birth father, biological father, that he longed to see. He was so nervous and excited at the same time to meet his biological father. But when he met him and told him who he was, your son. His biological father said, why are you here? I gave you up 18 years ago. Why do you think I would want you now? Then his father asked him to leave. Not all the Father's Day stories are rosy and perfect and hallmark worthy. 
But there is one thing sure. There's one thing that I want to say. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father will never <clears throat> deny you. Never deny us. Never leave us or forsake us. He loves us. And he gives us comfort, forgiveness, and he gives us reconciliation. And it even provides those in our life who serve as our spiritual fathers. This week as an exercise, I listed all the spiritual fathers in my life. In fact, I've written it here, and I won't repeat all of them, but Frank Asbury from Glenn Memorial, Carl Hines from Mableton Leland Church, Emory Hedgepath from Boston Church, Roger Hedward. And this congregation, I won't call out names because you're going to get mad at me, but I can say Bob Frazier was such a father to me. God will never leave us, deny us, forsake us, and will provide us with spiritual fathers in our life. Amen. So happy Father's Day. Go celebrate. Most importantly, praise God. Testify to his name. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.